welcome to Board Game Breakfast. This past weekend, I had the opportunity to go to the CMON, the Cool Mini or Not Expo in Atlanta, Georgia. And I had an absolutely fantastic time. Got to spend some time with Rodney Smith from Watch It Played and Steve Avery, my co-designer from Nothing Personal. And just a lot of fun that we had uh, while there. And a lot of things that you're going to see coming out of this of videos and things. And I'll talk a little bit about that more later. But as we get started with this, of course, let's start with the news. Okay, first from Fantasy Flight Games, we have a new expansion for Wiz War called Bestial Forces. This includes three new schools of magic, which will, uh, some of them will allow you to summon some new creatures. Uh, I think there's eight different creatures in the game. Uh, also, they've given out more information on how their new living card game, uh, Warhammer 40,000, Conquest is going to done by Eric Lang as you try to control different planets. And then, woohoo! A Cosmic Encounter expansion, a Cosmic Encounter Dominion, which is not a deck builder, but instead, this is an ex uh, a fan base expansion. The fans made uh, lots of different uh, alien races, and then people voted on them, and they narrowed it down. So, this is kind of a cool thing. It's kind of people coming together, and I would assume everyone's going to like it since they voted on it. Uh, Gale Force 9 has shown some pictures of the Sons of Anarchy, Men of Mayhem, and it has some pretty cool things, little plastic guns and uh, with boards. And I don't know exactly how the game's going to work, but we can assume you're not going to be nice to the other players in the game. Asmodee also shows off the cover art for Cash and Guns 2, which is a streamlined version of the new Cash and Guns, and they've changed the artwork completely. John Koblick from Dork Tower fame will be doing it. Very excited about this one. We've heard reports from a convention that Pandemic Legacy from Matt Leacock was being uh, playtested. Now, I don't know if that's the name, but basically Risk Legacy was a game where you um, the game changed permanently as it went on. And it's, there's other games coming out uh, in this same thing, and a Pandemic Legacy sounds cool. AEG shows off pictures of Munchkin uh, Loot Letter, which is a Munchkin-themed love letter. And I'm actually pretty excited about this because a lot of people just grab anything Munchkin-related, and this will be a really cool little game for them to play. Uh, the Juego del Año Tico Awards for 2014 were announced from Costa Rica, and that would, they have three of those, Dual of Ages 2, Zulkin, and Village. And finally, BZI Games is going to have a Start Player Express. Start Player was a deck of cards in which you drew a card and it told you who went first in case you couldn't decide. This you'll roll dice and whatever you roll will determine who goes first. Several games were released over the past week. We have the My Little Pony Canterlot Knights expansion for that. Lost Valley, a great game, finally reprinted after many years. It, check it out. I really like this game about getting hunting for gold. The uh, expansion packs, little the promo packs for Ascension, are are out. And the pocket battles, Union vs. Confederate. This is the fourth uh, version of the little pocket battle series, and they all work together. Hordes High Command, Immortal Tales, and then Z-Man has reprinted the great game Vikings. Then. I mean, look at this sucker here. We have the Tantive 4 came out. This, look how big this thing is. This is just amazing. Now, this uh, will certainly change the way many people play X-Wing miniatures, and I'll be doing a full review on it later, but as the little X-Wings go around and fight off this big thing, I mean, can you imagine a Star Destroyer? That's probably never going to happen. Damage Report, fun real-time cooperative game. And AEG, the Love Letter Box. I guess for those of you collecting Love Letter, I think this is the 20th version of that and Sail to India, a really cool little game. I mean, tons of game in a small box. What can you expect to see coming at Cool Stuff this coming week? Um, I think you'll see some Blue Orange games. The newest Mage Wars expansion is coming very soon. And the Playmats for Dice Masters will be coming soon. And since we're talking about that, last week we started a contest for the Dice Master Playmat. All the details of how to enter and be involved in that contest are in last week's Board Game Breakfast, so check that out. And I will be announcing the winners for that next week. <laughs> Hi there everyone, this is Scott Nicholson and welcome to the Ivory Dice Tower where I give you a view on games and play from the Academy. Over the last uh, seven weeks I've been talking about meaningful gamification, which is one of my main areas of research right now. How do you use elements from games and play that aren't rewards to get people to do something in the real world? 
And so I've talked about this recipe for meaningful, meaningful gamification, which is how I operationalized this whole concept by using the letters in the word recipe, that by using reflection and information and engagement and exposition and play and choice. And how can you use all these things to help people get engaged? And along the way, I've talked about, and, and I want to encourage you to think about how you could use these things when you make a game. If you design a board game, you know, as a designer, you have the ability to get people to do stuff in a game by offering them points or offering them punishments. Well, offering them the avoidance of punishments because rewards and punishments are the same thing. If you get a reward, you're avoiding a punishment and vice versa. So as game designers, we tend to rely upon those tools to motivate people to do certain things within our games. But think about these other things. Think about how could you add more choice, actual choice? How could you add more times where people engage with each other? How could you add ways to help people understand the context of what's going on? One of the things we don't do much of in our hobby games, in the Euro games, is really get to understand real world settings in the games we play. In, in, the, in war games, they do that very well. That's really their focus, is they take a historical situation and you get to understand it. Uh, but we create our own worlds many times, which actually, in my opinion, we're losing opportunities to help people to engage in real world settings in the games that we play. Um, how could you do that more? How could you provide more information, more context in what's going on? How do you create a more playful space for people to explore and engage and feel like they can fail? And how do you create opportunities for reflection? How do you create times in the game where people reflect upon what's going on? There was one game that I thought did this in a very interesting way. It started out as an individual game, six people all playing, and then at one point it was a racing game. At the midway point, it became a team game, and whoever was in the lead was teamed with the person who was in last place. And whoever was in fifth was teamed with this one, and, and the three and four were teamed together. And that created a moment of reflection, where these people had to then engage, reflect on what's been going on in the game, and how do we fix it. It created a cool mentorship opportunity for people who are doing well to help people who are weak. And then they finished as teams. And that was a really interesting idea. And I think about that idea a lot when I design my classes, when I design group work, that I want to create these opportunities for mentorship and engagement. And that actually is leading me into where all of this meaningful gamification goes next. And that is the idea of communities. How do we use gamification to build communities? That's what I'm going to head next in talking about this stuff on future episodes of the Ivory Dice Tower. So until then, I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>
the gamer community rebelled, lambasting AEG on their decision to use little sticks, posting such vitriol online as, I dislike the wooden rails. I'd like to hear the reason for the choice to make them sticks and not cubes. And even, I generally prefer cubes. Well, what company out there could withstand that kind of a verbal onslaught? And so, unsurprisingly, AEG eventually kowtowed to the pressure put on by these playtesting protesters, and the little sticks were re-implemented as cubes. But I've discovered an underground minority of brave gamers who are timidly asking from the shadows, what's the problem with sticks? The primary position presented by the protesting populace was that the little sticks suggested continuous linear direction as your train route spread across the board, whereas cubes retain a sense of omnidirectionality. This omnidirectionality encourages the players to spread organically in any direction instead of just in straight lines, which the naysayers feared would be encouraged by the use of little sticks. So, before I come forward and officially subvert this combative component conclave by sharing the process I used to upgrade the components in my version of trains, including how I swapped out the little cubes with other more linear stick-like pieces, I wanted to ask you, the board gaming community, what's your opinion? Should trains be confined to a quota of cubes? Join me next time when I'll review your answers and I'll cover the process that I used to upgrade my game's components. That is, if the sticklers nixing sticks haven't gotten to me first. In this segment, I take a look at gaming accessories and tell you what I think of them. This is a gaming accessory made for me by Robert Searing, uh, who is one of the folks on the Dice Tower staff, works on the website. And in this one, this is the Scoundrels of Skullport, an expansion for Lords of Waterdeep. He has, out of foam material, made a way to put everything inside this very neatly. So this is everything from Lords of Waterdeep and its expansion, and it's in one box. You can see here there are spots for the cards, um, or the buildings. Here are spots for the cards, and there's even room uh, on them if you, uh, you know, want to sleeve them. And then there's spots for each player color and the cubes. And now I've replaced my cubes with little people, but they still all fit in there. And then these pieces come out. You can take the whole box out and set it aside and use it over the course of the game. The, uh, the little player boxes also come out. So this is everything I, w I need to play if I'm yellow. While the other pieces are in here and it holds everything firmly, and when I put the board on top, it's great. Now I can't do this, um, or I guess I, I, I don't have time to do this, or the wherewithal to figure it out. Robert has done a great job. I'll show you his email address in just a second. If you're interested in getting one of these for games of your choice from him, um, this is pretty cool, and I really like how it all fits together and holds everything in a box. I'm a big fan of organization, and this is a cool way to do it. Oh, there's a game. Oh, what you play it for? It's for having fun and learning about the Cold War. Your mind like a mental pack of sharks. We'll be putting people in a place like Karl Marx. Spreading influence across the globe. In one of the best stories ever told. Twilight Struggle Play it on the double Communist Troubles In Twilight Struggle Some Jews would rather stay home with their girlfriends and snuggle But I'd rather go and play Twilight Struggle uh -oh -oh -oh. Galaxy Trucker as the name implies, Galaxy Trucker is a game where you play as deep space long cargo haulers. The game has two phases to it. There's the building phase and the flying phase. During the building phase, players use a Carcassonne-like tile placement game to build their ships and try to pack it full uh, of as much good stuff as they possibly can. Uh, the catch is, it's done in real time. It's not turn-based, so you are under a time crunch trying to fill your ship to the best of your ability. Then you have the flying phase. This is where you find out if your building skills are up to snuff because you're going to face a series of uh, increasingly dangerous and lucrative event cards. The player who can best capitalize on the events that they encounter and best build a ship to survive the hazards is going to be successful at Galaxy Trekker.
take it away. Now, I could stand here forever talking about space games, but there's just one last title that I want to bring to your attention. You may have heard of it, recently won a Mensa Select Award. Uh, that is... Gravwell from Quiptozoic Games and designer Corey Young. Players in Gravwell are starship captains trying to get their ships out of a black hole and to the safety of the warp gate before anyone else does. Players play movement, repulsor, or tractor cards to move their ships and move enemy ships around the board. Cards are played simultaneously though, and they are resolved in the order of their initiative value. Uh, so you never know exactly when in a turn you're going to go. And this is really important because your movement is always towards the closest object to you. And that will change based on when in the turn you get to go. Gravwell, real mind bender of a game. Give it a shot. So, that's all the time we have today for space games. So my friends, set your phasers to fun. Really? That's the joke we're going with? Set your phasers to fun and play some great space games. Hey, I'm Tom Basil, and this is Jason Levine. And today we're here to answer some questions or a question. Today's question is from Charles and Charles has a question on games that play differently with different number of players. What I mean is there's a lot of games that they play the same way. Pretty much, doesn't matter how many people play the game. But some games change dramatically. Like a the two-player game might be completely different than the five-player game. A good example is there's an older game called Castle. You ever play Castle? Yeah, yeah. And Castle, you play cards in the table and it makes cards go back into someone else's hand. And in a six-player game, total chaos. But in a two-player game, it's very strategic and tactical on how you play. And they both play very differently. Is that a good thing for a game to have? Yeah, I mean, there's other games like that too. Carcassonne's another one where when you're playing with five people, it's very chaotic. You don't know what tiles are going to be there at the time. But if you play with two people, it's very strategic on where you're going to play your tile and you're only going against your opponent so you can set up moves better. And I think it's a good thing when you have games that are multiplayer but then also work well in two. Yeah, I think Carcassonne's a good example. I do think that there are some games where... where it, it plays horribly with some of the numbers of players. There's some games where I'll say I'll never play them. Usually it's with the most players because either it's too long or too chaotic. And then there's some games that say two to something, but the two-player version is usually garbage. Yes. Any, to me, if you're going to use a two-player game, it has to be something that actually works in two players. It doesn't have these rules where there's fake robotic units that do things in two players. Those I never like. Only when it actually works in two players do I like it. So if you're designing a game, I think you need to think about each player count. Many times designers have told me they make a game and they'll say, well, I made it basically so it plays with four players. And then we put on the box, we put two to five. And when you play the game, you're like, ah, it really only works with four players. Uh, a good example is Blocus. Blocus with three players does not work. No. Because one player is at a disadvantage in the game. Um, and so they needed to think about that. They should have said two or four when playing it. I, I think you have to be honest or at least thought about how you were going to do the third player yeah. straight off the bat. So, and I, th I think that's something a designer should take into uh, effect. But for games that play differently, sometimes that's kind of cool. Sometimes it's a bad thing. I agree. Suzanne here with this week's featured board game app. The juggernaut that is Hearthstone recently arrived on the iPad. With its slick production quality and its free-to-play business model, is this digital CCG something you want to delve into? Let's take a quick look. In a Magic Light card game, you use cards representing creatures and spells to try and knock your opponent out of life points. After you play a few rounds and earn new cards, you can start customizing your deck, allowing you to try new combos and develop a personal playstyle. There's a nice variety of cards in this initial release, but I know veteran players are looking forward to the upcoming expansion for new challenges. You can play in practice mode for solo play and unlock cards as you level up. You can also earn coins by completing quests, which allows you to purchase booster packs of cards. Overall, I think you earn cards at a decent clip if you are a casual player only.
If you want to play competitively or in ranked play, I suspect you'll end up wanting to invest real dollars for blind boosters. Hearthstone's interface on the iPad is very intuitive and easy to use. The graphics are stunning, but I think the sound effects get repetitive quickly. Hearthstone plays flawlessly on a computer, but is less consistent on an iPad. I tried it on an older device and a brand new one, and there was a noticeable performance difference. So if you have an older iPad, be aware you may experience a bit of drag and crashing with the app. And if you're going to play online, make sure you have a stable internet connection. One of the best things about a huge company like Blizzard running this machine is that the game is completely multi-platform, so you can play from the same profile from your computer or your device seamlessly. You do need to create a Blizzard account, uh, but it's easy to find friends to play against once you've done that. And the random matching is solid, but a few times I was matched with players that clearly had stronger cards. As a casual player, I love Hearthstone. It's polished, it has simple mechanics that stretch to a wide variety of strategies, and it's quick to play. But if you tend to get caught up in games like this, make sure you know what you may be getting into when you start this one. Other than that, give it a try. Okay, a very short Tom Thanks this week, but I was talking to someone else when we were talking about our kids and having our kids on our videos. And I often have, you'll see Melody and Holly probably the most, occasionally Amy, uh, Violet, Ruby, Clara, and someday maybe Jimmy. But you know, they can or cannot be on these videos. I will never push them to show up on a video. And I wanted to talk about that. I know I've talked about this before in one of my news segments, but I, I just wanted to reiterate it because it's a really important thing to me, is that my kids don't have to be gamers. Because if I do that, it's kind of a reverse against some of the, the uh, prejudice that was shown to me when I was a kid. I still remember playing video games and how uncool that was. The people who played games in the computer, and I would program little basic programs, and people looked at me, called me a geek and a nerd. And I wasn't a really big fan of that. My dad was not that way. He was not much of a gamer. He played board games, but that wasn't what he wanted to do. He wanted to play sports. He wanted to throw a ball. He wanted to throw football, uh, play basketball. And I did those things with him occasionally, and he, he, you know, he wanted me to get involved with that. But he never said, you have to be on the sports teams. You know, Go do this and that. And I want to be the same way towards my kids and never think one of my kids is better than the other kids because that one is the one who likes to play games with me. Some of my kids like games more than others. Melody and Holly really enjoy games and want to play them often. Um, the other ones um, aren't quite so interested, although they all like games. And you know what? Maybe next year Melody will say, I'm not interested in games anymore. And that's okay. My goal when evangelizing games is to get people interested in games and get people to play games. But if you're not interested in games, that's fine. There are many wonderful hobbies in the world, and I don't think everybody has to be a gamer. So, I mean, because there's many things in the world that people say, this would be fun for you to do, and I say, I'm not really interested in that at all. So I need to be that way towards others. Gaming is getting bigger and bigger. I don't want us to become the bullies. I want us to say, hey, this is something cool. Oh, you're not interested? No problem. There are other wonderful hobbies that you can be involved with. Oh, sorry, I interrupted you again. I'm, I'm so sorry, you go. Terribly yeah, sorry. Yeah. Ladies first. No, no, it's her right age before beauty. Hi, welcome to the Board Game Nights. I'm Christoph Schroeder. I'm Jessica James. And today we'll be looking at cooperative games. Now, these games are ones where players work together to beat a common goal. They also tend to be very difficult games, as if they were too easy, they wouldn't be much fun. Mm -hmm. A game that we reviewed recently is Forbidden Desert, where players work together to escape a sandstorm. Another good example of this mechanic is in Escape, the Curse of the Temple, where players are all trying to work together with their dice rolls to thus exit the temple. Hey guys, can I help for this bit? No, no. no. we can oh. do this by ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, no, okay. we're good. We're a good team. Yeah. Um, cooperative games are often have little or no competition, however, a lot of modern games have blurred the definition of what cooperative is, such as Cutthroat Caverns, where it's caverns, where you work together to defeat all the monsters and get through the caverns, except 
only one person wins, mm. and that's the person with the highest prestige. Yeah, the person to land the killing blow is the one who scores the points. So you yeah. are versing each other the whole time you play. Exactly. There are more recent games that make this a little bit more crazy. One they, all. One versus many. Mm. So a game like De Descent is a big dungeon crawler D&D type game where you, your party moves through the dungeon, killing monsters, advancing along, but one person is trying to just mess up all of your plans together. Yeah. And so. then, a game like Letters from Whitechapel, is one person playing as Jack the Ripper trying to hide from the police force. Okay, now Christoph is going to talk to you about quarterbacking. Come on, Christoph. Quarterbacking is that sort of thing where one player is dictating the gameplay for everyone else. Yeah, and you've got to talk about the fact that it doesn't it doesn't make it better, it makes it worse. Yeah, I know, it's a bad thing when it happens yeah, and, in games. And, so. and their self-worth, they feel like they're not actually it's playing anymore. It's a bad thing in lots of cooperative games. Christoph isn't very good at this, I'm sorry. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of your book and breakfast. And that's it for today. Thank you for coming and listening to yet another board game breakfast. Like I said, lots of cool things coming this week. Uh, I'd like to thank all the contributors uh, who are involved with this each time. So uh, always we like to hear in the comments the things that you like the best about this. And we're always looking for more people to get involved. Fantastic. Lots of fun this week, guys. Can't wait to see you next time. I'm Tom Vassell. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production. Sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.